Okay, hello everybody, and in this video today, I'm going to be talking to you about the contraction of skeletal muscle. So the first thing that we have to think about when we think about skeletal muscle contraction is what is making it contract. And what is making it contract is an action potential arriving down the motor neuron at the neuromuscular junction. So that word neuromuscular junction is referring to the point where a, a neuron interacts with a muscle. So if a neuron and a neuron are interacting, we call that a synapse. And then when a neuron and a muscle are interacting, we call that a neuromuscular junction. And you know already that this is always a motor neuron. It is the motor neuron, which is part of our peripheral nervous system, which interacts with muscle cells and causes them to contract. So let's think about the process. An action potential arrives at the motor neuron terminal, so at the end of the motor neuron, so the axon terminal. When the action potential arrives, this triggers the release of neurotransmitter. This neurotransmitter diffuses across the cleft, uh, across the neuromuscular junction, and then when it reaches the sarcolemma, so the muscle fiber plasma membrane, this triggers the formation of an action potential on the membrane that travels down the T-tubules. And if you remember, when we were talking about the structure of the plasma membrane, the sarcolemma on muscle cells, we said how they had these infoldings, these extensions of plasma membrane called T-tubules. And these T-tubules, they reach down into and between each sarcomere, enabling each sarcomere to receive the information, to receive the action potential and trigger that sarcomere to contract. So each individual unit within the muscle fiber will contract in response to the arrival of this action potential. So let's just look at the process of this action potential propagating along the T-tubule membrane. So we can see that this depolarization is propagated along the T-tubule membrane, the sarcolemma. As it is transported towards the interior of the muscle cell, it will eventually come near the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This depolarization of the T-tubule membrane causes voltage-gated calcium ion channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open. This means that calcium ions can now leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So calcium ions, they flood out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum by diffusion down their concentration gradient and they enter the sarcoplasm. Remember before how I said we keep using this prefix sarco when we're talking about muscle cells? The sarcoplasm is just the word for cytoplasm that we use in muscle cells. Just accept it. So now let's try and visualize the sarcoplasm. We've already learned about what we find in here. We find the sarcomeres, the actin and myosin filaments in these long, thin and thick threads with the M line in the middle, the Z line at the end and separating into all those bands that we learned about before, the H zone, the A band, the I band. Okay, so that's where we are now. So we've got these, the actin filaments which are made up of these globular actin proteins and we've got the long filamentous tropomyosin protein lying on two sides of the actin and we know that that tropomyosin is covering up the myosin binding site on the actin and we also know that the globular protein troponin is attached to the tropomyosin so the calcium ions have flooded into the sarcoplasm 
from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium ions bind onto the troponin. This causes the troponin to change conformation. It shifts, it changes its orientation. And as it does so, it pulls the tropomyosin up. This exposes the myosin binding site on the actin. And it allows the myosin head to bind on and form a cross bridge. So now we have formed an actin myosin cross bridge. Let's look at that process. Once the myosin head attaches to the exposed binding site on the actin and forms a cross-linkage, the phosphate is released and the energy stored in the head of the myosin is used to move the head. The myosin head pivots and pulls backwards towards the M line. This is called the power stroke. As the head pivots, it pulls on the actin and the actin slides past the myosin towards the M line. So the myosin doesn't move anywhere, but the myosin heads pivot. As they pivot, they pull the actin inwards towards the M line. So the distance between the M line and the Z line shortens. As the myosin head moves, the ADP that was attached to it from the previous contraction cycle is released. So let's look at that process. So let's just take a minute to think this process through. We can see the myosin head pivoting and pulling the actin towards the M line. So the actin filament slides past the myosin and it moves closer to the M line. This causes the distance between the Z line and the M line to shorten. Just take a minute. What will that do to the size of the I band, the A band and the H zone? The I band will get shorter. The A band will just stay the same length. Because remember, the A band is the area that contains both actin and myosin. And neither of them have actually shortened in length. It's just the actin has moved. So that now there is more overlap between actin and myosin than there was before. The H zone gets smaller and disappears because remember, the H zone contains myosin only, but now the actin is being drawn into that section and the actin, if it's a full contraction, the actin will meet at the M line now and so there will be no H zone. What will happen to the length of the whole sarcomere? Well, because the two Z lines are being brought closer together, the whole sarcomere will shorten. Okay, but we understand that one 
pivot of a myosin head will not contract your whole muscle because these are tiny, tiny molecules. So they will cause the actin to move in a tiny distance. We need this to happen over and over again, many, many times, very, very quickly in order for your muscle to contract. So the myosin head is going to pivot, pull the actin in a tiny amount, detach, go back to its original shape, reattach to the actin and pull it in again and detach and reattach, pivot and over and over and over again. This happens incredibly rapidly, many, many times so that your muscle can contract. So this is occurring in cycles. So our myosin head is attached, it has pivoted, so we've had the power stroke. Now, the bond between the actin and the myosin head is broken when an ATP molecule binds to the myosin head. This ADP is broken down into ADP and phosphate, and the energy which is released from this hydrolysis is stored in the myosin head. So now the head of the myosin returns back to its original orientation. It reattaches to the exposed myosin binding site on an actin a few molecules down, forming a cross-linkage. The energy stored in the head is used for the myosin head to pivot the power stroke. It draws the actin chain in further. When this occurs, ATP binds onto the myosin head, causing the breakage of the crosslink, and the whole thing starts again. This will continue for as long as calcium is present. As long as calcium is present and bound onto the troponin, drawing the tropomyosin away from the myosin binding sites on the actin. So the only way your muscle can relax is if the calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When the calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this then causes the tropomyosin to recover the myosin binding sites on the actin. They can no longer form cross linkages and then the myosin will no longer form the power stroke and the whole thing will fall back to its original position. So interestingly, both contraction of muscles and relaxation of muscles is an active process because we know active transport requires ATP. So let's just look at that process again. So which parts of muscle contraction require energy? First of all, the power stroke, the movement of the myosin heads. Secondly, the reabsorption of the calcium ions into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by active transport for muscle relaxation. And thirdly, for the formation and detachment of cross linkages between the myosin head and the actin. So, muscles need lots of ATP. So we would expect lots of mitochondria to be present in muscle cells. And we would also expect those mitochondria to be highly folded, to have lots of electron transport chains. When muscles have to respire anaerobically, this can be problematic because we can suffer from muscle fatigue and the buildup of lactic acid. So your body has ways of delaying this muscle fatigue. And one way is by the presence of a molecule called phosphocreatine. Phosphocreatine is able to donate a phosphate to an ADP directly, a substrate level phosphorylation. So phosphocreatine can be converted into creatine and it donates its phosphate to ADP to form ATP. So your muscle has a, a supply, a source of phosphocreatine, and you can utilize that. And once that phosphocreatine has all been converted into creatine, 
then then you've run out okay so then you become problematic you might get muscle fatigue so this is an energy store when we're not when we finished exercising one of the things that your body has to do is reform phosphocreatine from the creatine to build that back up and that's part of your oxygen debt so you need to use atp later to reform your phosphocreatine so let's just look at that process Loads of names, loads of processes. It's the kind of thing where you really have to visualize it step by step. And I want you to do that. I want you to draw out the stages. What is the myosin doing at each stage? What is the actin doing at each stage? Where's the energy coming from? So where's the ATP, the ADP, the inorganic phosphate? When does each bind on? When does each detach? These are all questions that you need to be able to answer. In addition, you need to be able to use the language. So sarcolemma, sarcoplasmic reticulum, T-tubules, sarcoplasm, phosphocreatine, all these new words that we've learned. So this is a cycle. It requires ATP and it occurs as long as calcium ions are present in the sarcoplasm. So both muscle contraction and muscle relaxation are active processes slightly off topic but when you die these calcium ions they just get released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is why when you die we go into rigor mortis so when we die our, our muscles tense up which is an interesting byproduct and you can't relax them because you can't get rid of these calcium ions because that would be an active process okay lots to think about good luck thanks very much